Hi, my name is Sue Mallet. Welcome to this short course on designing diagnostic test accuracy studies, the absolute essentials you need to know. I work at the Centre for Medical Imaging at UCL in London in the UK, and I'm going to share with you important tips I've learned in designing these studies over the last 20 years. The introduction to diagnostic accuracy studies is a series of short videos, each highlighting a key learning point. In each video, there are short activities where I encourage you to pause the video and think. If you're watching with colleagues, this is a great opportunity to discuss together. After each activity slide, I'll share with you my thoughts and insights. This is part six, why accuracy is wrong if the wrong patients are recruited. This is part six, are these the right patients? And here we've got some patients you may remember from the introduction Part one, we've got the baby, we've got the person in intensive care, and we've got the set of patients who are in primary care. So when we look at a study, either we're designing a study or we're applying the results from a published study, when we want to know whether the results that we can see in those studies are going to be reliable estimates of diagnostic accuracy that are suitable for clinical practice, we need to be using the test in similar patient populations, similar settings, similar place in the clinical pathway, which meaning similar prior tests and symptoms, and on a similar target condition, the target condition is the definition of disease you want to diagnose, and using similar test methods, those are the methods of the manufacturer or the staff who are interpreting the test. So these are really important things you need to know when you're looking at the results from someone else's study or when you're designing a study. You need to make sure you've got all these things it that are right in order that the results you get from your diagnostic study are actually suitable for applying in clinical practice. Okay, so let's talk about this with a, a theoretical example. Um, so here we've got an ideal test for prostate cancer. Now this would be the ideal test. Here we've got the number of patients here and here we've got the level of a biomarker. Okay, and ideally we'd have normal patients and they'd have a really low level of the biomarker. They're not all going to have the same level of the biomarker because uh, not everyone has the same measurement. There's measurement error and there's also variability between patients. So we've got one of these nice normal distributions of the results from the people who are who don't have prostate cancer. And here's um, a little graph of the results that we might expect for our ideal test, our perfect test the prostate cancer and here are people in red who've got prostate cancer and they've got again this distribution of results with respect to a biomarker level here. And what we can see this is a perfect test so there's no false positive or false, uh, false negative results these results perfectly uh, they don't overlap at all so if we take a threshold here we've got no false positive and no false negative results this is just the perfect test. OK, so unfortunately, that's not what it looks like in normal, uh, normal life for any test. You know, there's, there's almost no test that's perfect. I think the tests for fracture on, Im fracture on imaging, they're probably about the most perfect you can get. Um, and again, that would be only for particular fractures. Not all fractures are easy to see on imaging. But here's a typical like PSA or something. So here we've got the level of our PSA in nanograms per mil. And um, this is a usual threshold that people might use in clinical practice, somewhere around four. It might be three, it might be four. Um, and here's what, the u here what, here's what the actual distribution looks like for those normal people. Um, again, we've got that nice normal, dis normal distribution, um, bell-shaped curve. But all the people without prostate cancer who are in green, this is what their results look like. And here's in the people in red are all the people who have prostate cancer. Now notice some people don't actually have a, a PSA result above four and they still have prostate cancer. Some people do have a result above four. Many, many do. Some have very high res results. Many have sort of me medium results. OK, but also what we can see here is now these two sets of people overlap. So there are some people who um, don't have prostate cancer who have a PSA level above four, and there are some people with prostate cancer who have PSA below four. Okay, so there are these people in red who are below four. If we took the threshold of four, these would be false negatives. 
Um, and those might be more common in those with mild disease. And then we can see that we've got green men here who are above the threshold of four. And this might be more likely in, in older men who have many more false positive results if we take a threshold of, of something like four for PSA results. OK, so when we're doing our when we're doing our um, studies, what we find is that some of those very early phase studies um, take extremely uh, people with extreme disease, really advanced prostate cancer, and they take healthy controls. And here we are. So what they've done is they've taken a few people here who are healthy controls. They might be uh, medical students, so they're quite young. They've got nice low PSA levels because they're in their 20s. And here we've got people with advanced prostate cancer. So they've got really high levels of PSA, and that might be because their disease is spreading already. So what you can see is that when you look at these early phase studies, it's, it's as if we have that ideal test, isn't it? We've got no one um, in green who's above the threshold and no one in red who's below the threshold. And that's because we've picked people who are atypical um, of, of the normal people who would have the test. We've picked those you know, healthy controls and we pick those late phase disease. Now, this is a really important stage. If a test doesn't pass this, um, and if it's not useful even on these extreme patients, it's not going to be useful on a normal clinical population. So these studies are really worth doing, but they're not going to tell us about the diagnostic accuracy of a test for when we want to use it in clinical practice. OK, the next phase is where we use studies with a slightly wider range of disease. So we might have... Um, now we might have people who are healthy, but they're in the correct age range. So we're getting more of a spread of these um, people, green people results. And again, we might be taking a wider range of people um, with a right, wider stage of a set of stages and grades of prostate cancer. And so, again, we've got a wider spread of PSA results. OK, but still, this is looking like that ideal test when there's no overlap between the distribution of the green people and the red. So you know, there's no green people above four, there's no red people below. Again, it looks like the ideal test. So again, this is a really important study. And if your test doesn't, isn't clinically useful when you're in this stage, it's not going to be clinically useful when you're in your normal set of population. So it's really worth doing this study. However, it still doesn't tell you about how the test would perform on a normal clinical population. And for that, we need to be looking at all of these clinically relevant people. So here are all those people. Now we've got everyone in there. And what you can see is now we're going to have some people with false negative results. We're going to have some people with false positive results. So these uh, early phase studies are really important. But it's also really important that they're not presented as if they're clinically relevant results because they're not. OK, so we're going to do a, um, one of these pause and think exercises. So this is about um, lateral flow tests for SARS-CoV-2, that's for COVID-19. And um, what we're going to do is use the results from uh, the study here. So what we can see here are the results of sensitivity and specificity. And they're presented for two sets of patients. One is patients with a clinical symptom of COVID. And here's people without a clinical symptom of COVID. OK, so um, what I want you to do is I want you to look at these results. OK, and um, here you've got DP equals the number with disease positive. So these are so um, we can see here we had in, in the, these results for sensitivity and specificity. These were from 939 patients of which 222 had infection with COVID-19. Uh, with COVID OK, and here again, we can see the numbers that we've got. So that's important to know what those numbers mean and what they look like, because that tells us how reliable we think the results are. Do we think this was enough patients to have a good enough result for sensitivity and specificity? OK, so what I want you to do is pause the video and think about what you notice about the diagnostic accuracy results from the symptomatic and the asymptomatic patients. Okay, 
What do you notice about those results for sensitivity and specificity? OK, welcome back to our pause and think discussion. So um, I asked you, what do you notice about the diagnostic accuracy results from symptomatic and asymptomatic patients? Well, hopefully you picked up that here, what we've got is a sensitivity of 74%, meaning that 74% of people who are symptomatic are detected with this lateral flow test. OK. However, I hope you also noticed that only 23% of people who are asymptomatic are detected. OK. Other things you might have noticed are that the specificity is very high. So there's very few false positives. So if people get a positive result, they're very likely to be positive because we've got very few false positives. However, when they've got a negative result, what we know is that 26% oh, that 20, of those with disease also had a negative result. And here we had 77% of people. So vast majority of people um, who were, had no clinical symptoms, who were asymptomatic, vast majority of these people will turn up negative with a lateral flow test. So what we learn from this is that the percentage of people who actually turn up positive with a lateral flow to test is highly dependent on whether the person has symptoms or not. OK, so here's another pause and think exercise. I hope you, I hope you uh, took some time to think about that last one. Now we're going to build on that because now we're going to actually look and think about how many people would actually have um, a positive test result. OK, so what we're going to do is what I want you to do is um, so we so what we know is that these SARS-CoV-2 lateral flow tests only pick up high levels of virus. So if if they um, if they don't have virus in their nose and, and they haven't fro fro swabbed their throat or the uh, disease is so advanced that actually now the virus is in their lung and no longer in their nose, then the, um, both the, the PCR and the, um, the lateral flow based on nasal secretions will not pick up those people. We also can see that the PCR detection is actually typically highest at four days post-infection. OK, it's lower before and it's lower after. OK, and that's because of when the, the virus um, replicates in the nose. OK, and what we know is from uh, that roughly 70 percent of people are detected with PCR at day four. OK, so now let's. Um, so now what I want you to do is to actually work out the actual numbers of people who would get positive and negative results. OK, using these lateral, lateral flow tests. So first of all, I want you to think about who, how many people would get a positive result with PCR if we had 100 people who were infected. How many symptomatic people would be detected by PCR and how many symptomatic people would be detected by a lateral flow test? OK, and I'd like you to repeat for asymptomatic. And what we're going to um, assume is that there's the same level of detection by PCR um, for both symptomatic and asymptomatic. OK, and um, so what I want you to do is look at these numbers here and turn them into how many people would be detected of, of 100 people infected, how many symptomatic people would be detected by PCR and how many symptomatic people would be detected by a lateral flow test? And then repeat that for asymptomatic. And then um, I'd also like you to think about if you're advising someone on who received these test results on whether they're infected, what would you say to someone who receives a negative lateral flow test result? And what would you say to someone who receives a positive result? OK, so I'd like you to pause the video. You're going to have to do a bit of calculation. You can get your calculator or your phone out um, and uh, see if you can come up with the actual numbers of people who would uh, be detected by these different tests. Hi, welcome back to the Pause and Think discussion. So what we're trying to do here is work out if we had 100 people who were infected how many symptomatic people would be picked up by PCR 
and how many symptomatic people would be picked up by the lateral flow test. Okay, so let's start with PCR. So we've got 100 symptomatic people uh, are detected, and what we know is that 70 will be detected by PCR. That's because 70% of 100 is 70, okay? And when we do the calculations, we find that 51 would be detected by lateral flow test result of those with symptoms, okay? So I've done some work-ins here. So here um, we have 100 symptomatic people infected. So 100 times 70% equals 70. So that's our 70 detected by PCR. And of the 70 detected by PCR times 74%, so we had 74% of them here were detected, uh, symptomatic people were detected by lateral flow. So 70 times 74%, 70 times 0.74, is 51 detected by lateral flow test results. Okay, so now if we look at the asymptomatic, we've got 70 detected by PCR, and now we've got 16 of 100 people are detected by lateral flow test results if they're asymptomatic. Okay, so let's have some workings on that. We had 100 times 70%, so 70 detected by PCR. And of those 70 detected by PCR who were in this study, now we've got 70% um, times uh, 0.23 or 23%, and that makes 16 detected by lateral flow tests. Okay, so um, when we're advising people who are receiving test results and when they're infected, what would we say to someone who receives a lateral flow negative lateral flow test result? Okay. Well, if they're symptomatic and they've got a negative result, they've got a, a sort of 49%, just about 50% chance that they still have the um, infection, even though they're um, negative with the lateral flow. So it's a one in two um, that the lateral flow will pick them up. Of the people who um, are asymptomatic, they've taken the test um, they've got a negative result, but we can say to them, you know, almost 80% of you, um, over 80% of the people, 85% of people would actually, even though they're infected, would still turn up negative with a lateral flow test result. So this is not a very reliable result, particularly for people who are asymptomatic. It's not reliable for people who are symptomatic either. Um, so what we can say is if you get a negative result, um, you don't know whether you're infected or not. Okay, so these results from this paper, they, they don't actually report who did the swab or who did the test, but it looks like it was done by a healthcare professional. And what we do know is that um, when, when it, um, people self-test, on average, there's a 10% lower sensitivity from self-testing. So let's look again at those results. What happens if people take their own swabs and do their own tests? So what we've done is we've moved these sensitivity results down by 10%. So instead of 74, we've got 64% sensitivity for people with, with symptoms. And for the asymptomatic, we've now got 13%. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is again calculate out of 100 people who are infected, how many people would have um, positive lateral flow tests if they had clinical symptoms, doing their own test, um, doing their own swab, doing their, doing, doing their own swab, doing their own test, and how many of the asymptomatic people would have a positive lateral flow test result? So pause the video and have a think. Calculate your um, your numbers of, of, of infected people with, with test results. Okay, so let's look at the, the people who are asymptomatic this time. So again, 100 asymptomatic people who are infected. So we've got 70%, 70 detected by uh, PCR. That comes from our 70% we had. Um, detected from PCR, so 70% times 100, so it's 70 people detected by PCR. And now we've only got nine people detected by lateral flow, so that's 70 times 
0.13 or 70 times 30, 13% of 70. Okay, and if we look at symptomatic people, now we've got, if we had 100 symptomatic people, we'd have 70 detected by PCR and 45 detected by lateral flow. So this 45 comes from 70% uh, uh, of 100, that tells us, so 70 people detected by PCR, and of those detected by PCR, we can detect 64% of those. So uh, a little bit over half of those um, with the lateral flow. So 70 times 0.64 or 64% times 70 equals 45. Okay, so here's another pause and think exercise I'd like you to do with the person sitting next to you or, or on your own. Um, so these lateral flow tests are um, only going to pick up people with high levels of virus in their nasal secretions. Okay, and they typically only produce positive test results on the day after symptoms appear in those who will become symptomatic. Okay, so how could the behaviour of people receiving a negative test, uh, negative flow test result be different from someone who knows they've been exposed to virus but has not taken a test? And what would you recommend using lateral flow tests for to reduce the spread of SARS-CoV-2? So I'd like you to, so I'd like you to just have a little think about this, um, and then let's come back at the end of the, after you've, you know, paused the videos, written some notes, had a little think about this, um, and let's come back and um, discuss them. Okay, so welcome back to our pause and think discussion. So, um, so we're remembering that we actually had, if you're symptomatic, we had only of 100 people infected, we had only 45 people um, turning up positive. And of those uh, with no clinical symptoms, um, of 100 people infected, we only had nine people turning up positive with the uh, lateral flow test result, even though they were um, actually had infected with the virus. OK, so for preventing symptomatic spread, would it be better to recommend restricting indoor contact with others if you had symptoms? Because even if you have symptoms, you've got, you know, less than half of the people will actually turn up positive with the lateral flow test result, even if they have infection. So would we be better saying if you've got symptoms just stay home just restrict your indoor contact with people um, if you have symptoms i think that's true and if your symptoms aren't actually from a covid infection but they're from an influenza infection maybe that's um you don't want to give people influenza either okay so um we found that only nine percent of people who are asymptomatic um, and infected actually would be detected and on, only 45% of those with symptoms will be detected and they're typically detected by lateral flow test one day after their symptoms. Okay, so if you've got symptoms, uh, you're not going to be detected until the day after your symptoms occur with your lateral flow test result. With a PCR test, you will be detected on the day of, the day before symptoms typically. Um, with the, or, or on the day of symptoms, but with a lateral flow, you'll only be detected on the day after symptoms. Okay, so um, what would we advise people? Again, if you've got symptoms, don't wait for that positive lateral flow test result. Just go home um, if you don't want to spread to it, your whatever you've got to other people. The lateral flow test result on the day of you get symptoms is not going to help you know whether you're positive or not. Those with negative test results, unfortunately, usually typically believe they've got no infection. And so they will mix with people, including vulnerable people, um, in, you know, in the belief that the test result is telling them their status. Um, so maybe we're better actually restricting indoor contact with anyone um, prior to meeting vulnerable people. So if we don't want to be in a chain of infection then we need to isolate ourselves for a few days 
four or five days, um, we need to isolate from indoor contact um, with other people in order to prevent asymptomatic spread. So if you're going to meet your granny who's very vulnerable, maybe you'd like to work from home for a few days before you go and meet with her. So again, all of this comes back to probably our best option is to get vaccinated if we want to reduce morbidity from um, COVID-19. Um, the vaccination, as we know, may not reduce spread of the disease, probably doesn't, but neither will testing with the lateral flow test results. They, won't also, they also won't reduce spread very much because of the asymptomatic people. We've only got 9% who are turning up positive with these lateral flow test results. If they're doing the tests themselves, it might be 16% if someone else does the, the swab and the test um, for them. OK, so again, this all comes back to if you want to know you want to rely on results, you've got to have the right people in the study. OK, if you want to know about the diagnostic accuracy of COVID testing in populations, we need to include asymptomatic and symptomatic people. And we need to analyse those results separately because they may well be very different. And when we're using hypothetical populations and we actually go down to what we call natural numbers. So those, that's when I got you to actually go from sensitivity to the actual number of people who got a positive test result if they're infected then that can make it so much easier to understand. And you might have found yourself going, OK, 74% sensitivity, that sounds fine. And then being shocked that it was actually, um, you know, only 45% of, of, of um, people who are infected who are actually being detected. So I think these natural numbers, when we actually get down to, say, in a in a hypothetical population of 100 people who are infected, how many would we have a, end up with a positive and a negative test result with our test can make it so much easier to understand and apply. So the other thing to remember is that test results on their own rarely change disease spread or the disease course. So you need to do something after you get a test result. So, um, for example, if you've got a lateral flow for COVID-19, you need to it's not actually getting that test result that changes the spread of disease. It's how people behave when they get their test results. Um, and so it's actually treatment of behaviour that are mechanisms to changing patient outcomes, not the actual tests themselves. Um, and there's a, I've got some videos on looking at sample sizes and how what, some, what happens to sample size when you go from looking at diagnostic accuracy to patient outcomes because studying patient outcomes is really hard and it usually requires a really large sample size. So just again, just be really aware of that because um, that's a very important thing to understand in these studies. So did you do well in the pause and think activities? Well done. And I hope you learned some good stuff from this video. The next one, I look forward to meeting you in part seven, which is about index test comparisons.